Um, I just want to welcome everybody. Chat is open, so feel free to chat with everyone. And um, I'm going to introduce you all to our executive director, I'm sorry, our president of the Fibrolamellar Cancer Foundation, <laughs> John Hopper. Um, and then soon after John or not John speaks, we're just going to um, go away and let you guys have your evening. So, uh, John? Perfect, perfect. You'll, you'll, you'll want us to go away fast so you can have a fun evening. <laughs> hey, thank, thank you guys for coming. Uh, as Sandy said, I'm, I'm John, and I head up the foundation, and um, welcome. But hopefully next year at this time, we'll all be in Vermont. I mean, that's one of the best uh, gatherings that we have. And you see Kylan's name over there, and Kylan's been to many of these gatherings. It's just a fun way and a relaxing way for you to meet other people, you know, who are, who are fighters like you guys are. And it's just relaxing, and we go book. In boats, we go hiking, and it's just people stay up really late, and we have a lot of good food. So hopefully next year we'll have a chance to do that. So this is kind of our replacement for that. It's our kind of virtual team gathering, and we hope we can do more of these. But it's a way to connect you. So real fast, I mean, the foundation was started by people like you. It was a young guy who named Tucker Davis who uh, didn't know anybody else but Fibro Miller. And he's like, this is ridiculous. How can I not find somebody? But as you guys know, it's very rare. So he said, let's start with his parents and his friends. Let's start a foundation so we can, we can connect. We can find each other. We can connect. We can support each other. And it's grown for 11 years now. So we do a lot of research because the big thing is we're looking to find a cure as fast as we can. So that's a big priority. We do a lot of education so people know how to even pronounce fibrolamellar. Because I'm sure if you said it to anybody, like what? So uh, we do a lot of that, and then importantly, we try to bring patients together so that fighters together, so that you know that you're not alone. And if somebody's not in the town next to you, they might be a Zoom away, or it might be a phone call away, or whatever it might be. So, and that we find that's a really important part of here. So that's basically the foundation. And you'll hear more and more from us as your parents will, but thank you for coming. But this is the first one we're doing that actually is doing for teenagers. And again, we're looking forward to hearing from you folks too. So let me just tell you who's just in the little boxes. I feel like I'm, um, I don't know, Hollywood Squares. Is that still around? I'm going to age myself. <laughs> Match games. So you see Kara, and she's on my left. And Kara is with Teen Cancer America. She's one of the managers there, and she sets up programs all over the country for teens to gather in person or virtually. Uh, you've got Alex also there. Alex also with Teen Cancer America. He's one of their major patient ambassadors. You're going to hear from him. Kylan is one of us. He's a, he's a fibro fighter, and uh, Kylan's been yeah, part of the foundation for many years, and he's going to be one of our new ambassadors now. Because the, the head guy from Facebook and Instagram, Mark Zuckerberg, actually found that he really thought fibromyalgia was a cool cancer that he wants to help cure. So he's given us some money to try to do more things with young people like all of you. So, uh, so we're happy that Instagram and Facebook likes us now too, right? So with that in mind, I'm going to pass the baton over to Kara and thank you all for coming. Thanks, John. Hello everyone, my name is Karen Oskoff and like John said, I work for Teen Cancer America, um, but I have worked with teens and young adults facing cancer for the past seven years. So I worked as a child life specialist at a children's hospital here in California, um, where I got to sit at the bedside with a lot of teens and young adults that were diagnosed with all different types of cancers. Um, and my big mission was to um, not just focus on all the things you can't do anymore, but on all the things you can do and, and helping them navigate their treatment journey, but then also how do you get back into school and work and, and things that are important to you, like socializing with your friends and um, music and sports and dance and watching Netflix and, you know, all those important things um, that are hard to do when you're in the hospital or you're going through treatment. Um, and then I think one of the biggest things was just bringing people together. Like John said, um, you don't need to do this alone. There are people that 
get what you're going through and that are in this with you, um, even if you don't have the same exact type of cancer or the same age or are in the same state, um, there's so much that we can um, connect on. And so my big passion is to bring people together. And that's why I joined Team Cancer America about a year and a half ago. Um, and our mission is to partner with hospitals all across the country. So we're partnered with uh, 44 hospitals and we work with both pediatric and adult hospitals and we're helping them create programs and services specifically for people like you. So from the moment you walk through a hospital, um, it doesn't feel like it's just for little kids or it's just for adults, um, that there's a space and, and services that are specific for teens and young adults. Um, so talking to you about your diagnosis so that you understand and that you have a little bit more control in it. Um, and can you can communicate with your nurses how that medication feels or when you want to take that medication. Um, and then people that help you reintegrate back into school and work because you've missed a big chunk and, and it's, it's difficult to get back into that. Um, we really want to make sure that people are getting the age appropriate care that they deserve. Um, but we also, again, want to bring everyone together nationally. Um, and so, you know, just tonight I'm already hearing we have people from Washington and Colorado and, and all over the place. So that's really exciting um, because it's helpful to see the bigger picture because um, it can feel like it's just you, especially with such a rare cancer. Um, we want to bridge that gap and bring you together and know that there are other people that get what you've gone through. So we do um, monthly, um, every other week we do a game night. And so we were excited that your foundation brought us together and we're gonna give you a little taste of what that's like. Um, so I'm gonna have Alec show a slide um, and we just wanna get to know you a little bit better. So if you're able to access your chat at the bottom of the screen, please introduce yourself, um, your, your preferred name, where you're from, and then if you had a favorite member of your health team. So this could be a favorite nurse that stood out to you, um, a child life specialist, a doctor, um, maybe it was the, um, the housekeeping, the janitor that came into your room every day. Um, maybe it was a favorite phlebotomist, um, someone that really stood out to you during any of your appointments or hospital stays? Honestly, I did have a really awesome janitor that used to come by. He, um, I don't speak Spanish and he spoke no English, but we would just like have these moments where we would just like, he would just like essentially like hang out in the room and we would have these like, as best as we could language barrier conversations and uh, he'd bring his snack with him and he would just like post <laughs> up and we would just like, low-key have a meal together as much as I could eat and he could have his snack uh so that was now that you mentioned I forgot all about him oh. every person that walks into your room is is making an impact for sure I love that To start with, uh, I kind of talked a little bit about my cancer already, but I was diagnosed with Ewing sarcoma when I was 19. I was in my freshman year of college. Um, it was about a football sized tumor in my left hip. It was on the nerves that ran down my left leg. So I couldn't walk on my left leg. I couldn't use it at all. Um, and I, like a uh, the dumb teenager that I was, was like, no, no, it's cool. I'm fine. It's fine. I'm fine everything is good. It's all good. And my dad was like, no, 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 it's not good. Um, I had come down just a little bit to um, go to prom with a friend from college. And, um, and my dad saw me changing was like, uh, uh, definitely not. And so Sunday was my MRI. Monday was my biopsy. Tuesday, port emplacement. Wednesday was chemo. I was just such a, a rush job for me. Um, and that's also, I think, kind of like what we were talking about, where I don't remember it, really, because they all happen so fast. And they put me on so many drugs right away that I was just like, oh, oh. Um, and so then my treatment was 11 months. Um, I, as a baby, chose my parents really well. Um, my dad is a cancer doctor, so I chose super, super well. Um, 
uh, because that is how babies work. You get to pick. Um, and so I know that I got like the literal best treatment that I absolutely could have. Um, and I was lucky enough to be treated in one of Teen Cancer America's facilities actually, which is how I kind of got involved with them. Um, so all of my nurses were trained to work with young adults and the space was for people my age because like babies, I didn't necessarily want to hang out with when I'm like 19 and like also like 80 year olds are not necessarily my best friends in terms of like relating, but having like a, a place that I could kind of go and like talk and hang out with other people was really awesome for me. Um, and so that's kind of how I started advocating with Teen Cancer America and got involved. Um, I just hit my five year in remission earlier this year. So I'm very excited about that. But uh, I mean, as we all know with cancer, sometimes, it, you know, you never, never really feels like it's totally over. You're kind of like, I, I'm, I'm good right now. And I'm good right now. And so every time scans roll around, you have that moment where you're like, um, but Overall, things have been really good. I'm really thankful to continue to be a part of this space. I think it's really like nice to be able to like relate my experience to other people because as much as, sorry, Kara, uh, other people can like understand you, they don't really understand you. Um, and there's just some things that you, you talk about. Like, I mean, IV Benadryl is something that people who aren't in cancer also get but there's a difference between taking the pill Benadryl and then IV Benadryl and IV Benadryl hits you like not one truck, but three at the same time. It's like a full train coming at you. Um, and I think just having the ability to kind of just like have that moment to be like, Hey, look, like I wasn't the only one and my cancer is also very rare. And so to meet other people that like had my specific experience, has also been really rewarding. I actually talked to someone who had my specific diagnosis earlier this week. Someone knew that I hadn't met before and I was like, wow, like to find another one, but how, how lucky. And that's kind of like what it's been like for me. I After cancer, I've had a bunch of up and downs. I am really grateful that uh, I you know, sought out, like you're saying, Jamie, mental health, um, found myself a therapist because you know, cancer doesn't end with the end of treatment. And people say all the time, like, oh, you're done, great. And pretend like everything is cool and fine. And, and in a lot of ways it is. And in a lot of ways it is. And in a lot of ways it isn't. But overall, I'm doing well. And I'm glad to be here with all of you. I have some follow-up questions, if you don't mind. Anytime, I'm ready. Put me in the uh, ring. See. So you have this football sized tumor in your hip. You didn't feel that? Are you like, did you have any symptoms leading I mean, up? Besides the part where I literally could not use my whole left leg. <laughs> and you just. My muscles had literally atrophied down to the bone. So I had no thigh, right? Like it was like, it was a two inches across my upper leg. I walked with this like swinging gait because if I didn't keep my knee locked, I collapsed because I'm an idiot. And I was like, no, no, it's cool. I'm fine. I'm fine. Um, you yeah. That's, you just thought you had like some swagger. I don't know if you can call that swagger. Uh, I was definitely like, because I played sports in college and I was like, no, like after the season, I'll go get it checked out. Like after the season, I'm pretty sure I just like pulled my groin. It's probably just a groin pull hmm. and, it, um, and and it probably there was probably a groin pull because I had a literal football that decided to grow in the middle of my groin um, but so yeah I had symptoms but I was still young enough to be invincible and know everything so and then for your last question sorry um, for your like follow-up care now or survivorship care um, how often do you get scans? I just hit the point at my five year where I get scans once a year. And of course, any time that I am feeling not normal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I get blood work done twice a year. Okay. So when I was diagnosed, of course, my family was a part of it. Um, my immediate family, uh, my extended family lives kind of all around the world. Um, both my parents are international. Um, so when I was, you know, 
we got that diagnosis in the end for me, because my cancer was so large and so clear and my dad is a cancer doctor, we actually knew what was going on before we got the official diagnosis. Um, but my mom cried, my sister cried, my dad pretended not to cry. Um, and I think in a lot of ways, partially because I was on drugs right away and then partially because everyone else around me was crying, I was good. I was like, look, you guys do the feeling. I'm great. It's great. Everything is great. Um, but I remember having this moment because it's the moment for me, the scariest moment is knowing something is wrong and not yet knowing what it is. Because for me, once I knew what it was, I knew that there was like a plan and that plan, like cancer treatment sucks. But for me, like there was a plan that I could kind of like focus on and follow. And I could, that kind of helped me get through it. Um, and so I remember having this time between, you know, Monday when I had my biopsy and Tuesday when we got the official results um, that I essentially had like a panic attack and I had got in the car. I was like, I will be back in time for the appointment. I promise. And I drove, I left. And I actually, I actually ended up driving to my ex-girlfriend's house just because she lived nearby. And I was like, I don't know what else to, like, I don't know where else to go. And it's 6 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> it's 6 a.m. in the morning. Um, and I, I, knocked on, I knocked on her door and her mom answered in a bathrobe and slippers. I was like, hey, really weird. I'm so sorry about this, but I have cancer and I just, I just need to like tell people. Um, and so they were really supportive um, and we ended on good terms. So I will say that nothing like happened because that would have been absolutely unreal. But I, looking back, that is like maybe the nutsest thing I could have done. Um, we drove up, I went to UC Santa Barbara and I live in Los Angeles. So in, in kind of that shuffle, we drove up to Santa Barbara and moved all my stuff out in like a couple hours. So my roommates had no idea what was going on. I came in, I was like, hey team, got cancer, goodbye. Great to see you all, um, we'll not be back. Yes. Uh, congrats, your very small triple just turned into a double. You got a lot more space. Um, and I spent a little bit of time with my other friends from college. Most people cried. Um, I did call one friend from high school on the phone. Um, he's a really funny guy. Uh, he's got a whole bunch of other stuff and, and we have a very similar sense of humor. But he was like, hey, Alec, next time you're gonna tell me that you have cancer. I need you to ask me if I'm in a good place first. And of course he meant it as a joke. He meant it entirely as a joke, but it was just one of those moments where I was like, totally. Like it's a lot for people to handle. It's a lot, yeah. Um, the people that I wasn't super close with, also a mixed bag, a lot of people kind of dropped off. Um, I had a close friend um, that like felt really awkward talking to me, didn't know what to say and wouldn't reach out because of it. Um, I reached out to him a couple times because our families are close. And so I like knew what was going on. And I think the longer it went on, he just like, the more it built up in his head. And I still haven't talked to him five years since. Um, our parents go on vacations together like it's not like we're not close to that family it's just he I think has such like a stigma in, in his head about it now that he he's really bad um, on that front overall people were pretty good I think most people don't really know what to do um, I have a pretty brutal sense of humor sometimes and I'm not afraid to wield it um, and I think sometimes that catches people off guard, but my closest friends, the people I've lived with, things like that, um, they always make the joke, like I know who my real friends are because they laugh when I make cancer jokes. Um, so that's kind, of, that's kind of my mixed bag of people. To this day, my family is not thrilled if I make any jokes. I get that. I have a friend actually that blew his hand off in an explosion. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll go up and I'll high five it and I'll be like, damn, did you get diagnosed again? <laughs> that same friend I was talking about, his name is Gus. And uh, we make the joke all the time. He's like, God, I've just been having terrible depression lately. And I was like, have you tried just being happy? And he'd go, have you tried just not having cancer? And I was like... <laughs> um. So I got diagnosed when I was like 13 in 2012. And it's kind of a funny story. I mean, not, I mean, it's, it's a sad story. It was also a funny story. Um, 
I had like a I have kind of a hypochondriac, whatever you want to call it. Back when I was little, I'd always like get little ailments and complain about them like they were worse than they were. But I called my mom because I had a really bad stomach ache on my like bottom right side of my stomach. And mom's like, okay, we'll stay home and, and uh, you know, put some ice on it. I keep calling her back. She's like, I'm at work. I can't leave. Finally, I get her to come home. And she's like, if you're not sick, I'm going to be pissed. <laughs> and so we go to the hospital and I'm sitting there in pain and then it goes away and I'm sitting there bouncing off the seats because I have ADHD. She's like, I'm going to be so mad. She made me take off work and you're not sick and you're going to be in big trouble. And we go and they do a CT and they're like, good news. You don't have appendicitis and bad news. You have a a grapefruit sized mass in your, in your, in your liver. And mom was like, I was like, hell yeah. I high five the doctor. I was like, I ain't get to go to school anymore. That's what I'm talking about. And he's like, son, I don't think you're going to be going to school for a long time. I was like, yes. <laughs> um, uh, I'm sure my mom still never, she never said anything like that again. Um, anyway, so I go to the hospital and I get transported to Seattle. And they're like, uh, well, we need to do surgery, but it's really close to an artery. So they send a nurse in. They're all asking questions and stuff. And I have never gone anywhere. And I had purple hair at the time because I was 13. I had just dyed my hair purple. And they're like, have you gone to any foreign countries? I was like, yes, I've been to Bali, Taiwan, Indonesia. And they're like, oh, what were you doing there? And my mom's sitting there looking at me and she's looking at the nurse. And I'm like, I was handing dollar bills out to homeless people. And she's writing this down. She's like, were you bitten by any bugs? I was like, yeah, I was bit by a spider and a mosquito. She's all writing this down and putting it in the forums. And I was like, oh my God, he's kidding. And the nurse is like, looking at me, looking at her, looking at me, look, looking at her. She's like, are you serious right now? You're kidding me? I was like, writing this down. She's like, Ugh, crumples it up. It's like, I'm, she leaves. She was pissed. But uh, anyway, so the doctor was like, they didn't know what it was. And finally, they were like, well, you are most likely going to die if you do the surgery. And if you don't do the surgery, you'll probably die anyway. Um, Not as blunt as that. I mean, that was the gist of it. And uh, they gave me the percentages of like how likely a surgery was to complete. And it was it was a pretty uh, high rate of not success. It was like in the 90s of I was supposed to die. And then they're like, if you don't, you have a couple months. And my mom was like, well, this is your decision. I was like, well, I ain't trying to like live like dying because that's not how I'm trying to do it. I was like, so either do the surgery and have had a good life or like, you know, I'm not trying to live with a tumor in me. So I do the surgery and I make it. Um, and so I had a uh, grapefruit size tumor resected out of my liver. And interesting fact, I'm, I'm sure some of you may know this, but the liver is your only organ that grows back besides your like skin right so you know I had half of it resected and it's weird too because your organ shifts so like now when people look at me like if I go to the ER for any random reason they're like your body's weird looking I'm like oh thanks (laughs) yeah yeah thanks I I like that I have a unique liver right it's on like a snake shape and stuff it's pretty crazy looking if you look at it yeah so I was good for a while um I had a really long recovery. That was pretty rough. I didn't, um, so I didn't go into the, the cancer ward. So I was in the ICU every time because I always had tumors that had to have surgery. Um, so I never had anybody that was specialized in kids, never had anybody that was used to having somebody longer than six months, right? So a lot of the nurses were not, didn't have the patience for me because I was a child. And so a lot of the nurses were not very kind. A lot of them were just like trying to get me up and out, right? Um, that one was pretty rough, right? I had to look, relearn how to walk a couple of times. Um, there's one nurse that I, I, I hated him. I, I love him now, but I hated him at the time because he would always put a, like a belt on me and pull me out of bed. He's like, you're getting out of bed today. I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm pushing him and stuff. I'm getting out of bed. Leave me alone. And I was, I was a feisty kid because um, I didn't want to walk, but he made me do laps around the hospital all the time to relearn how to walk, rebuild my muscles. Um, and then I was good for a couple of years. I don't know the exact time frame, but then I came back for my three, I was doing three months of scans. Um, oh yeah. And then they finally figured out that it was fibromyalgia, fibro, ah, fibromyalgia, hepatocellular carcinoma. It's even a tongue twister for me. Um, and they're like, so we don't know what to do with this, but like, I mean, you know, so they assign a brain cancer specialist to me and he's like, I don't really know what to do with this either. I guess we'll just check on you every three months. I don't think treatment or radiation or chemo works very well. 
So we'll just do surgery. And then they assigned a surgeon to me. That was Dr. Gao. And we had a conversation about the lemons. And uh, then I, uh, I get re-diagnosed with uh, another tumor in my pancreas. And uh, so they're like, we need to do another surgery. So I go to another surgery. I have a resection out of my, out of my pancreas. And then I was good for a little bit again. And then I come back. And uh, I think I think I got rediagnosed with my pancreas, but this time when I was had surgery on my pancreas, they did in operation radiation. So I did radiation after they removed the tumor in the operating room while I was opened up. I was like, that sounds kind of scary. Like you can put your hands in me, but I don't want none of that. That's kind of scary. But anyway, they did that. And then I got out and I did a uh, continued six month radiation outside of outside of the hospital. Um, and I actually still deal with that because the way that it hit my spine, I actually have a compressed nerves now. So I have really bad sciatica pain now from the trauma that was caused to my spine. Um, and then, uh, what else was I doing? Oh, and then I left and they call me a couple of days later, like, Hey, we missed a tumor. I'm like, oh, wow, you guys are just fantastic at your job, aren't you? So I had to come back. I'm all thinking I'm recovering. I'm like, eh. So I come back and, and I and I have another surgery. It's in my lung. I had a tumor in the right lower lobe of my lung. So your right lobe is actually made out of three sections, three lobes. And I think your left, I think, is made out of two. Um, so I had my right lower lobe removed. That surgery sucked, okay? That one was terrible because they have to put, like, a tube in there. And, you know, I'm okay with, like, other surgeries. It's, like, fine. I've had other sur- all kinds of surgeries, and it's, like, whatever. But as soon as they start affecting my breathing, like, that's oof. And had the tube in there and it was all like itching. Like I almost tried to pull that out a few times. I was like, I'm tired. I'm tired of this. I mean, I was, I was a hard headed kid. I was, did not like it. And I did not like it. I was like, do not do this to me, but I had to get it done. Um, I was definitely lucky to have the support that I had, although it was also very scary because everything we found online. And at the time in 2012, there was no research of fibro. There's none of that. So everything was like, you're going to die. (laughs) <laughs> I, was, I was like mom get off your phone you're gonna scare yourself um I felt I felt really bad too because my date of diagnosis my it was my grandma's birthday and she was all like honeymooning with her boyfriend in California and she had to fly out and come to me I was all crying I was like I'm sorry grandma I'm sorry I have cancer and she's like it's not your fault I'm like I, I felt so bad I felt terrible um yeah that that one that one was pretty rough uh I think that Although I will say it's a blessing and a curse, you know, um, because I've learned a lot of things I would not have learned. And I've met a lot of beautiful people that I would not have met. You know, I, I wouldn't take it back, to be honest with you. I would never take it back. That's who I am. It's part of who I am. You know, it's a maybe stronger person mentally and physically. But at the same time, like cancer has been a lot more than cancer. Like Alec was saying, I've dealt with a lot of issues mentally and I'm at a very different place than I used to be, you know. Um, the scars run way, way deeper than, than your, than your skin, you know, the, the mental scars and, you know, the scars that was left on my family too. Right. I mean, my mom was scarred and, you know, all going through all of this, you know, it was actually kind of sad. I, I, I had kind of accepted death a long time ago because they told me I was going to die. I was like, okay, well, I got to kind of come to terms with this. So I did. And so the whole time that I was going through all my treatments, I was just trying to hold my my mom and my brother up and keep them up here and let them and try to get them to be okay with like having their son and their brother die. But I mean, I made it through, but after having had done that, I kind of forgot who I was and I kind of forgot that, you know, I need a dream for myself. So after I made it out, I was like, you know, I didn't think I'd make it here. I don't have any dreams or aspiration. Most kids are like, Oh, I'm going to college. I'm like, well, I survived cancer. I don't know what else to do, right? And they're like, oh, I'm doing this. I'm doing this. I'm doing this. And I'm like, I don't even know if I'm going to make it to 17, (laughs) right? But, you know, I worked through that, and now I have dreams and aspirations. But, you know, there's still that thing in the back of your head, right? You know, this could come back any day. I also, earlier in the year, hit my five-year remission. Um, But, you know, let's... Thank you. It's uh, it's still it's still scary. I try not to think about it, but you all, you got to think about it. You got to keep that in your mind. Right. I used to not talk, talk about it at all. I used to just like down. And when someone asked me, I'd be like, you know, it, it would piss me off when people asked me. Actually, it would make me really mad because they say it in weird ways. I had this one girl always coming to me. She'd be like, so how's your cancer? What? 
what do you are you are you seriously asking me that like uh, like how's your swollen toe I, like you don't ask that I guess how are you doing and and it would be an everyday thing right and it's like cancer doesn't define me it's not who I am like cancer was a part of me but I am not I'm not cancer right I'm my own person I think for a long time it definitely sucked me in so you know don't let it do that <laughs> wow Thank you so much for sharing. Does anyone have any questions for Kylan? I had a question. A month and then I moved to six months. And I, the, like I said, I still have a brain doctor. He's not really like specialized in fibro, but he's scared to push it out to a year. Mm -hmm. I don't like doing it every six months, but I'm like, I, I do whatever. So I think I'm pretty sure it's still at six months, but we're getting closer to moving it out to a year. Mm -hmm. um, and I just go do CT, MRI, blood work, and uh, I think that's it. But we stopped doing the CT juices, which was nice because I hated that warm feeling. I felt like I was going to piss myself. Yeah. I, was, yeah. I was like, I'm going to poop and I'm going to pee and I'm going to throw up all at the same time. And then I'm going to feel all warm doing it. And I'm like, ugh. <laughs> that's <laughs> gross. <laughs> now I just do an MRI and I just sleep. I go to sleep, take a nap. It's a nice nap. I cannot stay awake in the MRI machine. Take a deep breath. I'm like, <laughs> I, uh, I went to um, Camp Good Times is one of the ones I went to. That was a really fun time. I had a great time there. Um, I found that just literally in the hallways as I would walk around. They had boards in the hospital that had a bunch of camps, and I just looked it up and went to it. And then for the uh, for the make a wish, I ended up just uh, I think I'm pretty sure I just reached out and I was like, hey, do I qualify? And then I met my make or I met the guy who did the make wish grantor and I just went through it. I literally just reached out myself and me and him are actually really good friends now. We uh, we hang out and uh, we have a good time. So we I made a lifelong friend in that, too. So, yeah, it was a uh, it was it was weird, though, because. Oh, wait, no, they didn't have the cancer posters in those hallways. It was usually whenever I would like leave and go do like scans. I have to walk through all these different hallways or on Sundays. I think it was they had like this little this like room that had toys and stuff in there. And I was like 12 through 16. So I didn't want to play with little toys, but they had like puzzles and test stuff. And I would always go do that. And in there they had stuff for cancer and this and that but that was really the only thing that i had to socialize with right other um other cancer patients or anything having to do with that you know i didn't really feel like a cancer patient at the time i felt like i was just dying <laughs> I, that's, that's how it felt right it doesn't feel good the whole time um although i did meet there was this one kid across the hallway um i think his name was john and he had a really really bad brain tumor also cancer but he was in the icu he was a lot younger than me but i remember me and my mom would like craft these little things these little like uh, wood things for like go john and like you'll make it and yeah he was his was very uh he was his i mean his odds were just amazing he made it he's he's all grown up now and he's he's doing really good but uh yeah so that's that's that yeah it's very unique experiences both on pediatrics and adult and different resources are available so it's great that you were a good advocate for yourself and and found that and I'm glad that you guys have found this foundation and all the work that they're doing for um you know to find a cure for this so before we switch over to games I just want to open it up to anyone or if anyone has any other questions or or things that they want to discuss, we can do that 